My name is Beth Wolf, and I'm a pastor of a small congregation at a church outside of DC. Um, when my oldest was a little bit younger, I remember this exasperated yell coming from the other room. I ran into the room to see what was going on, and I got there just in time to see her chuck this pencil in the air along with this freshly crumpled up piece of paper. And all around her were all these balled up pieces of paper, evidence of previous tries that had gone all wrong. And when we made eye contact, she yelled again in frustration. And I was like, what's wrong? And she shouted out that she was trying to draw a ninja. And the picture was in her head and she could see it so clearly, but no matter how hard she tried, her hands and her pencil, she just couldn't make them do what she knew was possible in her head. She couldn't bring this picture to life. Now at this point in your journey, you probably have a picture in your head that you're hoping to bring to fruition. You have identified the problem that is going on in your organization, and you've even identified a greener pasture that you believe is possible, that you believe the church is supposed to be or your organization is supposed to be called to. But maybe you've experienced the same frustration as my daughter has, that even though you have this picture in your head, you can't quite bring it to real life. Now at this point in the process, you might be realizing that the version of church or mission or discipleship that you've been living out is not going to get you to where you want to go. And so you might be tempted to just scrap everything, to ball it up in a big garbage heap and throw it out the window because it doesn't look like the greener pasture you have in your head. But don't do it. If you really want to lead your people to that greener pasture, then you're going to have to do two things simultaneously. You're going to have to keep doing what you've been doing. And I know that feels completely backwards. Why would you ever do that? You already know that that's not going to get you where you want to go. It's not working. But there's two reasons why you have to keep doing what you're doing. The first reason is because this whole idea of go big or go home only works out if there's stability in other areas of your work and ministry. According to this guy, Adam Grant, who wrote this book, Originals, he shows all of these studies of, of how entrepreneurs who keep their day jobs while trying to start something new actually has have 33% lower odds of failure than those who left everything for a totally new plan. The same thing is true for people who are seeking to make a change, which I imagine is you. Being all in doesn't mean blowing everything up and scrapping everything. Instead, it means creating stability in, the, in most of what you're already doing so that you have space to create a picture for the future that you can then invite others into. By doing this, you'll actually relieve pressure to make a change too fast or rush to a conclusion too soon. That actually actually might end up losing the very people you're trying to lead along the way. Maintaining stability in some areas will actually help with the longevity and impact of the change you're trying to ultimately make. The second reason you're going to want to keep doing what you're already doing is because change is really, really, really hard for most people. Not everyone you lead is an innovator or an early adopter, and so for them it can be really, really scary. No matter how many times you try to tell them about this greener pasture, they're just not going to get it until they see it happening around them, and, and that's okay. Getting to where you are trying to go is not going to be a straight or easy or quick path as much as you want it to be. Getting there is going to require a lot of like bobbing and weaving, unlearning and experimenting. It's going to be kind of like going on the Oregon Trail uh, to this place that you've never been before and taking everyone with you at the same time is asking for a dysentery outbreak. So for now, let most of your people continue on the path that they're on. As they see the greener pasture become a reality around them, they're going to be excited about joining with you. The second thing that you're going to do is strategically pick a few people to journey with you in what we call the movement pathway. The movement pathway requires you to look at what's already in place and unravel what has been put in place that isn't working. It starts with you pulling the thread a little to see what's falling apart. You already started this journey in session one when you dug deeper and deeper and deeper asking why, 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 why to understand the problem that existed. Sometimes what we try to do once we know where we want to go is take shortcuts by making programmatic changes to our organization to make it happen. 
But the truth that we all know and hate is that program changes aren't gonna get you where you want to go. You're going to have to dig deeper. And the movement pathway leads you on a holistic approach that moves beyond the surface of, what programmatic changes do we need to make? It digs deeper to work at transforming the whole of the organization, its leaders, its culture, and the many individuals that are involved. Then we ask the question, what do we have to unlearn as a result of what we uncovered? What are some of the conclusions that we've always heard as true that maybe aren't? What are the things that we said, this is the right way of doing things that maybe they no longer are the right way to do things? What needs to be unlearned? It starts with you pulling the thread a little bit to see what falls apart. Now, you already started this process in your journey on session one when you began to understand the problems that were existing in your organization. Then the movement pathway asks you to dig even deeper still, to ask what's being uncovered in this organization and in me. It asks you to sort of start to see the ways that you live or your organization functions that's actually inconsistent with the greener pasture that you're trying to get at. This is a little bit of what you started in session three. It's only when we've done that work that we can begin to understand what's really going on and influencing our organization at the very core. And that will bring better awareness to the problem. This is when we can actually move forward and begin to build something new and take action. We'll wrestle with new paradigms, we'll integrate new learnings into our lives, and we'll also need to ask ourselves the question, how am I rethinking the core of this organization? Now having wrestled personally, then we'll invite our innovators and our early adopters to wrestle with these paradigms as well, and to begin to integrate new learnings and experiment with new ways of acting. We'll need to ask ourselves, how are innovators and early adopters giving me a glimpse of our better future? How might the stories of these individuals help shape our culture? We'll then enter into the development phase. As we utilize new learnings, we'll develop a culture and structure that mirror our clarified core and point towards our better future. Then we scale. We ask, in what ways can our new code mirror the new core and the new culture? How will this new code help further learning from the future to the many. Now in this whole process, please, please, please remember, it's not a sermon series and it's not an eight week focus group. It's actually a long haul journey. In my own church, we've been working on this process for the last five years and we are still in the process. But the deeper you dive, the more lasting and integrated the change becomes. In fact, it really isn't a one-time journey or a one-time deep dive. It's a journey that you keep repeating and reevaluating again and again. It's a slow faithfulness in the same direction towards that greener pasture. Now, you've likely forgotten all about it, but I wanted to finish the story I was telling you at the beginning with my daughter and the ninja drawing. She finally did figure out how to draw a ninja. And you want to know how? When I googled how to draw a ninja, there was this video that came up that gave this step-by-step -step instructions, draw an oval this way, and then draw an M shape this way, and now do it in the other direction. Now draw a straight line coming out this way. And step-by-step, step, she followed the person in front of her until she knew how to draw a ninja for herself. Sometimes making the visions that you have in your head become a reality takes someone else walking with you step by step to help you move from information to implementation. Now as a pastor, I know that there is so much to manage. The organization of the church as well as the needs of those that I lead. I have sought to make many changes many times in my leadership and in my church. And the lasting change came when I had connection to others as well as a guide to ask the right questions and to continue to remind me of the truths that I already knew but sort of forgot when I got in the busyness of the weeds. We would love to invite you to a follow-up cohort to walk with you as you address your challenge or crisis and journey with you towards this greener pasture to see missional disciples be made and mobilized, communities transformed, new expressions of the church pioneered, and ultimately the reign of God revealed. We're praying for you in what might be one of the hardest periods of time in your leadership. And Forge America would be honored to serve you and walk with you into the future.